All right, folks. Today I have a special guest. Uh, guys that some of you will be familiar with, I don't think maybe too much of the younger generation may be aware of this guy. But I'm here with, first of all, a good friend of mine, no other than Major Cummings, former uh, Major League Baseball player. So what we're gonna be, gonna be doing today is um, we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about uh, this guy's life when it comes to his past, the, uh, him coming up as a young man in the Virgin Islands in Saint Croix, uh, coming through the baseball system, and eventually getting into professional baseball as well as other endeavors that he may be involved in. So I'm gonna be asking him some questions. Uh, where he's going to be giving his very candid answers um, in regards to just, you know, his life coming up, uh, playing the sport of uh, baseball, and just life in general. Um, so how are you today, my man? Hey, brother, I bless me, son. I wake up this morning, I can't complain, so. All right, very good. So where, where are you right now? Where, where are you residing? I, right now, I live in, in Florida, Newport, Ritchie. Okay, great. All right. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, my name is Kuala Brannigan, by the way, and uh, I, I'm here out in Kennesaw, Georgia. So, uh, it's uh, pretty close to Atlanta. Um, so uh, let's begin. So I'm going to be asking you some questions. Uh, it's about 10 to 11 questions. Uh, so question number one, uh, tell me a bit about your childhood and adolescents are bringing in the Virgin Islands and how we prepared you later for your career in uh, professional baseball? Well, growing up in St. Croix, I grew up in a small place that called White Lady, which is um, pretty much was for only for veterans. My uncle was building a house and then he passed away. So my mom ended up taking the house and, you know, moved us into a four bedroom, two baths, you know, so mm -hmm. We was residing there, but in the neighborhood, I was one of the youngest boys in the neighborhood. I was at least about three to four years younger than the, the rest of the the rest of the guys who lived in the neighborhood. It was only about twelve of us, right. and we did a lot of stuff together. And uh, we played ball, basketball, we run races, we rode bikes, we swim. We pretty much competed in every aspect of life. And that's kind of interesting. You said you were like the youngest guy, so you probably yeah. had a competitive fire in your bones from young. Well, against well, older guys. well it, it wasn't competitive, you know, it was fun, you know, because okay. I had a brother who was 10 years older than I. He was very competitive, you gotcha. know, so if I wanted to play with him, I had to deal you with the step it up. I got to play with them, you know, and gotcha. I used to get hit. Um, I used to um, had to bring the water. I had to do all the little tangible stuff in order to play. You know, you want to play, you got to catch, you know, I seven, seven, um, eight years old playing with, you know, 16, 17 year old guys, okay. you know, wow. so okay. I learned to actually go through that little bit of getting beat up and learning the hard way, or they call it tough love, love. you know? And um, my mother was a police officer, so she wasn't no slack either. Got you. You know, she this was- Discipline uh, was definitely a part of your upbringing. It was very, very disciplined, you know? And my father, who was from Antigua, he was always about work and no play, you know? He was the one that didn't want me to play baseball because he figured that, hey, you ha a man supposed to work and support his family, gotcha. you know? So gotcha. that's the way he was brought up because that's the way he know, you know? But him and my mother used to fight constantly, you know, and she would be like, hey, you got lame, experience certain things, you know? Right. And, um, you know, being the last one, I had um, two older brothers, and uh, one was um, three years older than me. He kind of went through it late, but he wasn't really into sports. You know, he was more of a hands-on guy, Mr. Fix-It, you know? Gotcha. That was okay. his thing. You know, he liked oil and, and, and fixing care of my father because my father was a mechanic. So mm -hmm. he got that skill from my father, but I didn't like oil on my hand. I rather thought, 
you know. So, so how, how, at what age, so how, how were you introduced now to the Little League program? I assume that's where you started playing Little League at some point. Yeah. Well, I started playing at um, pretty much eight years old. Uh, okay. My mother had took me around to numerous Little League teams, and most of them didn't want me because I couldn't play. You know, I couldn't play at their level. So I was written off, you know. So my mother said, well, hey, you ran out a team in West. What do you want to do? So I had a lot of cousins that lived in Grove, so I would go by them. And gotcha. we saw this guy named Wayne Hawley was practicing a team. So my mother said, hey, let's go see if he, you know, be willing to take you. So I went there and um, she asked him, hey, you know, do you have room for my son? He told my mother, he said, well, right now I don't have any room for him because my team full. But if he wants to practice, you could bring him out. Gotcha. And, and that was it. You know, that I went out there and um, I played with Grove and um, I met a lot of great people from Grove, man. And um, my biggest fan was a guy, a guy called Galen Williams. Yeah, I, okay. I, I, I mean, Galen, I mean, up to up to this day, I always call him my idol, man, because I watch him play the game and he played it the right way. And what he had that a lot of people didn't have was called baseball smart. He knew the game. He had the IQ. He had his IQ was extremely high. And yeah. I really enjoy watching him playing. I, I, I played with him for um, two years and I learned so much from him watching him and playing the game. Right. So he okay, was one great. of my biggest mentors. Okay, great. And I mean, we're gonna we're gonna lead up to I mean um, we're gonna lead up to the professional part of your career and whatnot. Um, second question: um, Who would you say were the people that had the most influence in your life and your baseball career? Well, uh, by far and forth, my my parents. My my parents had the biggest factor in my um, in baseball career. Um, and then, needless to say my brothers and sisters, you know, and then, you know, my family and friends, you know, those were the biggest um, fans in my support. And there was a lady by the name of Miss Ferris. She lived across the street from us and she was the president of Little League. And um, she made sure that I ate when I went to the bar park. She was like another mother at the bar park. So Okay. Even if my mother wasn't there, I know I had to walk a straight line because I know Miss Ferris was there. And all of them contribute to, to my baseball upbringing. Okay. Anybody in particular in actually the sport coaches, whether on the amateur level, oh. the uh, well, professional level? Well, you know, Harris, Harris Clark was, was another, you know, big mentor of ours, you know, because I always go by his house. I grew up with his um, two sons, Jeffrey and JD. They're like my brothers, you know, I grew up in their house, you know, and every time I go in their house, the father had a big plaque of him like swinging a bat and, and I was like, man, you know, that, that was so cool, you know, and I was like, yeah. you know, one day I would like to have one of those in my house, you know, me swinging a bat in Italy. But, you know, all that was inspiring to me. Good, good, good motivation. Yeah. For what's to come. All right, uh, next question. Uh, growing up playing baseball in the Virgin Islands, was there any moment or event that stood out in your mind? Oh, man, easy. Playing against St. Thomas. Mm. That's, I mean, St. Thomas was like the pinnacle. St. Thomas was like the our wall series. You know, it, it, it was us against them, you know, yeah. and don't matter what we did after or before, we knew we had to beat St. Thomas. Right. You know, and it, it's, it was so um, intense games and just leading up to it, the hype about, you know, playing against St. Thomas, you, you know, everybody took it extremely serious. Our parents even took time off at work just to make sure they don't miss that weekend of baseball really? because, because you know, people from St. Thomas come in, people from East come in, right. you know, people from all over come in, you know, and it, it, that was the pinnacle of playing against St. Thomas. Yeah, because I, 
of course, I'm your age, so I played. I eventually played against you later on in my years in uh -huh. senior league. Um, unfortunately, the East could never make it out in the Little League uh, tournament in the BI. So you played against like Robbie Smalls, uh, Royo, and them kind of guys. Um, I, if I could recall, you correct me now. You correct me because this is the word now. If I could remember that they lost the game. Uh, 11 to 12 game because a guy dropped a play ball in center field. I don't want to call it. That's my understanding. It was it was a, probably like a tie series, and my understanding, the center fielder for the St. Thomas West dropped a ball in center field. Does that sound correct? I might be wrong. I don't remember. Oh, 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 it, it may, I think it was the last inning. and actually it was like this was it. Like this was it. The game would have been done. They would have been moving on. And because you dropped the ball, you guys won. I don't you know, remember. Man. I don't remember. I check up on that one, man. <laughs> I don't have I don't have to do my homework on it. But um, but I remember two rabbis. I remember Rabbi Ventura and I remember Rabbi Smiles. Okay. So was two the rabbis. What, I what do was well, yeah. I know the, the Rabbi Ventura, I know, was 12, and the other Rabbi Smiles was 15. He's the same dude. I, I, I figure I, I figure that now. <laughs> I figure it was two different dudes. That's like, man, yeah. Like, and, and interesting in, enough, and me and you had this conversation before, man, because uh, when I played, you know, back then they had no pitch count and all of that. Uh -huh. You know, we didn't have no pitch count. So a guy might pitch game one and pitch game three. So we thought yeah. more Friday, Saturday, and Sunday games. Okay, the problem I you had was uh, you had Rabbi pitch Saturday, no, yes. pitch Friday, for the, the first game, and then play shot stop Saturday. Yes, and try to come back to Sunday. Rabbi never never walk. Walk. that would have never worked. He never worked. And we had <laughs> pitchers that was finesse, that was um, pitch Friday. But they never played Saturday, so they had at least a day rest, and then they, they was a little bit fresh on Sunday. So Sunday we had the advantage because our coach Genix, we used to condition, he used to condition us. So we used to do a lot of running, and um, we, I mean, before practice we would run, after practice we would run, even during practice we would run. So we was always conditioned, you know. Friday night you would beat us, but every if you look at the, the record, Friday night, you beat us by one or two. But Saturday, we beat Ayo by five. The next day, we beat Ayo by, you know, like a close game, you know. But we was getting stronger as, as the yeah, game goes on. To be honest with you, it, that, that used to have, that's what happened. The two years I played, uh, the senior league, I think the first year I played, you didn't play. I don't know for whatever reason, because I think me and you are about the same age. Mm -hmm. uh, that was with like Coy Superville and no, I didn't play that. I was talking. I was, them guys. I was talking uh, at that time. Yeah, I was yeah. Well, I, 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 I somehow made the team. I don't know. I, I was surprised I even made that team because there's a lot of other guys. So I played that, and the exact same thing happened, literally, where Robbie played the first game, second game, close game, third game, he come back, and same results twice yeah. in yeah. a row. You know. So yeah, those days are really, uh, I have a lot of fun memories about those days. Um, that's when, of course, I start to hear, but this guy needs the comments and all the power and all of this and all of that. So I saw it for a son for myself, uh, you know. All right, uh, next question. Well, actually, this kind of covered another question I was going to ask, uh, so I'm not going to skip over that, about the senior league championship game and stuff like that. Uh, I, I, you remember Moscoso? Hey, he was a bad the, boy, Mister. Yes, I yeah, remember. Yeah, 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 man. That, that, yeah. that was our, that was our clubber. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is anybody who got a point out was Moscoso. Yeah. I you remember he, and I remember a guy named um, Juice. Juice. Lincoln Gums. Lincoln Gums. Yes, yeah. yes. That's our stuff. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then, man. um, and then are you pretty boy, pretty boy, um, Bucci Plow? Bucci Plow. Bucci. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes, I remember hey, him. Um, to, to even talk about that, not, not to spend too much time on that, but when you really think about it, me, Jay, when we played, honestly, and maybe other people could speak about their time, but when we played, we played a high level of baseball, you know, because when you look at 
those two teams or that age bracket, both islands, you look at it, the, the amount of guys that end up playing professional baseball, just, just you guys alone, the, the, the team that you played on alone, um, I think it's at least both, at least seven or more guys. It's easy, easy. You know what I mean? If you think about it, when I played at least about four, at least four or five guys played. So it was very competitive. Um, things have changed over the years. Um, there's a lot, a lot of good, good players. And even guys that weren't even making a, a team, you know, that probably yeah. could have made the team easy. And, um, and, and unfortunately, for whatever reason, even back then, we didn't, we didn't really have the exposure. Like, as you can see later, we thought guys had to leave for things to kind of materialize. But if we had some type of system or something going back then, where like scouts, college coaches and stuff could have come directly to the islands from then, it would have been interesting to see where the Virgin Islands baseball would have been now because of those opportunities and where the game may have been taken, the island, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I, 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 mean, I mean, we actually shot ourselves in the foot because our biggest thing was if we are only Marge, mm -hmm. if we are only Marge, we would have brought so much more scouts. We would have brought um, a better caliber baseball and we would have sent our best to go compete to represent the Virgin Islands. And I think that was the biggest downfall because we never really sent the best, you know, although we never. won it, I don't think we was the best. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they, like what you said, there were guys that left off a team that we know that could easily help us, you know, push to the next level. Level, Absolutely. you know, You know, everybody talk about, you know, Robbie Small, how dominant he was, man. But they had, we had a guy from Christian Stead, man. His name was Stephen DeWeer. Um, he was 12 years old, man. And he was the best 12-year-old pitcher I've ever faced, man. Really? Yeah, he was the best 12-year-old. I remember uh, we played him when we was 12 in the All-Star. And he beat us one to nothing. And I could remember I got in the car after the game. My mother turned to me and she said, my son, are you in trouble, you know? Are you in trouble, my son? I say, yes, man. We are in deep, deep water. Cause this boy is good. But again, they had the same mentality like St. Thomas. Pitch Friday, play shot stop Saturday, pitch Sunday. Yeah. Not that strong, you know what I mean? So we end up beating him the Sunday, you know? But hands down, he was just... I mean, if Robbie was a 10, this guy was a 9 and, and 3 four. He was right, right there. He was right that's there, man. You know? Interesting. You know? But, um, yeah, it, it, it was, it, if, if we are Marge, like what we were supposed to, um, we'd have had a lot more players come out of Virgin Islands and doing bigger and better things and, and setting, setting it up for the younger players generation behind us to follow in our footsteps right right good point good point all right all right next question um so at some point after playing senior league and whatnot you eventually moved to the states um you probably could talk a little bit about that um to play ball in the states i mean the question is what what's the difference between playing ball in the bi in the u.s so Maybe speak a little bit about that transition you made, when you made it, why, um, when you actually moved to the States to you know, play high school baseball and things took off from there. Well, the, the difference is everything was more organized. You know what I mean? You know, everybody had the same uniform. Everybody looked the same in the uniform. Everything was organized. Even the stretches was organized, you know? If the games, if the game was at three o'clock, hey, the game started at three. You know right. what I mean? So you know, practice was organized. Everything was organized. You know, I'm not saying home wasn't organized, but you know, in the states, everything was organized. The umpire was dressed professionally. You know, it it, it just felt like uh, playing uh, yeah. you're playing baseball. You know, you have your fans um, cheering, you have your, your fans booing. But it was just pretty much very organized baseball and very fundamentally sound baseball. 
because at that point it's not about who is the better player it's just who played the game better on that particular day right, right. and that was the biggest thing i learned in the transition of playing in the states is you know i don't care how good you was if you don't execute you're not going to win okay so, so and, uh, and part of that you you um there was a group of guys from St. Croix that ended up, I guess, moving and playing on the same high school team. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jackie Ross uh, originally was a guy that moved up, and at some point, they uh, uh, request for you guys to possibly move up. Mm -hmm. Things to look out from there. Yeah, man. Um, after after playing in 1987 World Series and kissing me, Jackie, um, you know, he defected. <laughs> he defected uh -huh. to Miami, you know? Okay. And, yeah, yeah. and everybody was so shocked knowing that he wasn't coming back. But we right. didn't stood wide, you know? But I guess, you know, his parents had, um, was seeing a, you know, a bigger picture. So right. he went ahead and he went to Miami and we went back home. And after, I don't know if you're familiar with the leagues back home, you go from 13 to 15. 16 to 21 right you know yeah. so yeah. we were forced to play in 16 to 21 with wow. you know 18 and 19 year olds and you know you really had to own the stripes um some of us didn't really play much because who would you play a, a 15 16 year old or you play a 17 18 that has more experience right you got you got to go with the with the all 17 like yeah you got to go with the older guys the older guys so what ended up happening was, um, you know, our coach made a team, you know, which it wasn't a, a big span, you know, it was like from 16 to 19 or 16 to 18 and that, you know, so everybody could get opportunity to play. So we learned to play together and then we learned to grow, you know. Yeah, did we win? No, but winning wasn't everything. It was about learning, you know, and we ended up, you know, doing pretty good because, you know, after a while, you know, we were well conditioned. So we transitioned to the next level a little bit better, you know. But we got a call from Jackie and say, hey, man, I need to come up here because, you know, we need help, you know. So I was like, okay, what kind of help do you need? He said, well, you know, I guess the high school he went to was Miami Edison. They was never won a baseball game high school so when Jackie went up there um, let's say you played 16 games there was going on 15 you know so when Jackie went up there there was 2 and 13 and the two games they win Jackie pitch really? so, you know yeah so he had to really you know do lights out and then do it uh, get the hit and score a run be part of the you know like the offense also so after the first year he called us up and Remind you know we had a so full year how, of how much man went the sun. I, I want to say I want to say uh, Jackie was the first to go, and then I want to say Victor Appleweight went. Victor Appleweight went, and then after Victor Appleweight went, then Eddie went, Eddie Williams, and then um, then who else? Then it was me, Kareem. And Rasan, which is known as Rocky. Three of us went okay. up. And yeah. then um, Sean came up after. And then Nolan. Kenny. Sean Nolan, yeah. And um, when we came up there and we fill a team for the fall, man, a, 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 man, we were such a, a force to be reckoned with, you know. Mm. And um, we, we did stuff that a, a lot of teams couldn't do. You know, we was very athletic. But we also had the full year of playing with, you know, 16 to 21 year old players. So we had right, right, team. right. So playing against our age group was nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. So we kind of dominate, and then um, they start checking up on us, and they were saying that you had to be up here to play baseball for a year. And yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you know, so uh, one thing left to another. You know, they kind of broke up the chemistry, but. We still had a great team, you know, right. and uh, we just end up, you know, doing stuff that 
a, a, a regular team would not do, you know. But my biggest highlight of that was we was we was playing a game. Um, I was playing center field. Jackie was pitching, and Eddie was catching. And I want to say roughly like in the tall foot, and then Jackie get tired. So the coach came out and said, well, what are we going to do? So Eddie said, well, I go pitch. You know, mm-hmm. Eddie going to pitch. I from center field, I could go catch. And Jackie, who was pitching, could go center, center, field. Center, go center field. So everybody was like, what? You know? I changed up the spine. Yes. So um, <laughs> remember, Eddie wasn't a pitcher, but Eddie could, Eddie could pitch. So Eddie went about two innings, and Eddie get tired. So we not a mound visit. So the coach said, well, what are we going to do now? I said, but wait. I could pitch, Jackie could catch, and Eddie could go center field. You're kidding me. Man, that blew everybody mind, man. Wow. You know, that, that, that blew everybody mind, man. And then everybody was like, wow. We had a, um, a lefty. His name was Rocky. Rocky used to play third base. A lefty. Really? You know? Yeah, man. Rocky used to play third base, you know? And mm-hmm. by that, that opened up my eyes for when I started coaching because I'm not going to limit somebody to something that you don't know what you could do if they play there, you know? And um, Rocky was a hell of a third baseman, man. He made all the plays. Interesting. Yeah, man. You know, so you got you got me th- you got me thinking here now. I'm thinking about uh, actually a guy. Yeah, a lefty could play third base. I could see that. A lefty could I play anywhere in the infield. A lefty could play anywhere. He could play anywhere in the infield. Yeah. But just that we don't see it because we never yeah. taught it before. You know, that's not the traditional thing with the sport. Yeah, but if you teach somebody how to do it, they probably could do it. Because we've seen right. lefties had good hands, you know. Right. If you teach a lefty how to do stuff, they could maneuver it and they could, they could do a good job of it. Exactly. Right. So this yeah. is going to drive me to my next question. Because now after your uh, high school um, season or playing high school baseball, and uh, um, then that kind of catapult the interest from scouts and whatnot to start to pay attention to you and um, eventually um, got you drafted with the Minnesota Twins in the first round. I think you were the 29th pick of the first round or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Supplemental draft. Can we talk a little bit about that. So you got drafted with it by the Minnesota Twins in 1990. First round draft pick. And you ended up spending what about 14, 15 years playing professional baseball. I, I think collectively. Sure. And out of that, those years you spent about 11 years in the big leagues. Mm-hmm. Um, now this is interesting, and I got this from the Society for American Baseball Research. I'm gonna be honest with you. I I just recently read it, and I was kind of blown away with the fact that I didn't realize you played with 19 different MLB clubs. Maybe not all of them and, and in MLB, but you play with, no, sorry, not 19, nine, not 19, nine. 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 nine different major league clubs. I think that is absolutely phenomenal. That, 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 that to me, that's not normal. You know what uh, I mean? Um, can, I, can you name them? Can you name them? I, I have them here on a list. You ain't gonna fool me. I have okay, them on a list. Them. Name them. Minnesota Twins, and I'm gonna name them in order. Okay. The Minnesota Twins, Pittsburgh Pirates, Philadelphia Phillies, Boston Red Sox, Arizona Diamondbacks, Milwaukee Brewers, Chicago Cubs, Tampa Bay Devil Rays, and Baltimore Orioles. Uh, I'm missing anybody? You missed one. Who? Um, Cincinnati. So it's 10? Yeah. Okay, yes. And they did mention, well, they did mention Cincinnati. You're right. Cincinnati. Yeah. But I only, I only, I went from Cincinnati spring training and I get traded to Boston. Okay, okay. Well, it's still a count. I mean, you know, yeah. you're part of the team. So I think that's absolutely incredible, dude. I, I don't care what nobody says. Me people might come up with reasons. Well, how come you didn't stick with one team? Listen, for me, that's telling me you watch something because for all them teams, at some point, they be, have been interested in you. That speaks mm-hmm. volume for what kind of player you are. Yeah. 
I mean, that that just you know without saying. And then then at some point you end up playing. You say you playing one one uh one year winter league bar with a Dominican team. Their name what? Cabianos, Cabianos. Aguilas, Aguilas, Aguilas. From okay. Santiago. Right. Yeah. And um, you also play with a, a Taiwanese team. Yeah. A Japanese team. A Taiwan, so, Taiwanese team. Okay, a Taiwanese team. So, um, so, so you tell me, how were you able to to maintain and manage and get a foothold in the league like for so long with with all these different things? How you manage that? Like that's not normal for the well, average well, player. You, well, the, the more the more you play, the more you develop a, a style. You know, you you you, de you develop a system where you have to stick with you know do you make adjustments yes you make adjustments but you don't you don't make the full adjustment just to make it. you just have to go with the flow so gotcha. it, it's just that you know the game you know the rules you just play but you just have to play with somebody else's rules you know right. meaning right. if you go to another country and they drive on the right hand side you got long to drive That's on the right, right hand side right. but you still right. could drive you know what I mean? Right. You can right. still drive. So every team, every organization is very different, but it's the same. You know? One team might like to bunt more. One team might have a better philosophy in in um, running the bases. One team might be more defensive oriented. Another team might be a little bit more offensive, but you learn what they're trying to do, and then you just fall into place. Just fall into place. Right, and you obviously you were able to do that over and over again. Yeah. Uh, with every opportunity that was given to you. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. All right. Um, so I got an interesting question here. Uh, so we're gonna get a little bit deeper into your you. Okay. You made your comments. You know. Um often time you have been labeled as an enigma, meaning somebody who is sort of like misunderstood, mysterious, uh, puzzling. Um, give, give, me, give me your, your thoughts on that. And, and, and I'm, I'm saying that because um, when, I, when I read this, uh, when I read the, 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 the information from the, or the article from the Society for American Bay Bar Resource, and I've heard it before, you know, over the years, different people mentioning and having an opinion about me, the comments and blah, blah, blah. Um, I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. You know, how you perceive all of this that has been said in the past. Like, you tell me, what, what, what's your take on it? Well, the, 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 the whole thing comes from, um, I, I, I never did what they used to do. You know, um, what I mean was, I never used to golf, you know? So I wouldn't go golfing with them, you know? So they was like, oh, why you don't play golf? It's like, no, I don't understand golf, and I just don't want to play right now, you know? Right. And then, you know, after a game, a lot of guys would go out and drink beers and stuff and clubbing. That wasn't my thing. So I wouldn't go out with them, and I won't drink a beer along them, you know? And they was like, well, you know, you're too good, or, you know, you're not one of us. You know, even the, the, the American blacks, they didn't even think I was black, you know? They used to call me tropical, you know? So I was more closer to the Hispanics, you know, the Puerto Ricans, the Dominicans, because we had the same culture, mm -hmm. you know? They would kind of cook the food. We would do stuff together that bring back our culture. You know, guys, uh, American guys would go eat pizza and hamburger. I don't want to eat that. We would find, right. the Spanish guys would go find a, a, a Hispanic restaurant to rice and beans, it's too chicken, it's too beef. You know, we go find that, the empanadas, we go eat that, you know? But I never really ran with the crowd, you know? I did my own thing, you know? So you, so you were somewhat stigmatized, like you, you, you were not yeah. considered one of the boys. Yeah, and I guess you would, you, would, you would attribute that to as well as to the um the 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 the, the um the, the managerial level as well. Not yeah. just players, but what about management? Like how how did they perceive you? Or well, maybe well, you could give I, a, a scenario or something. Well, well, you know, um, I I came up with um, in a time where veteran players was the king, 
you know, if he was a veteran player, you, you put your time in and you was king. You know, the young guys, the rookies who was just coming up, I mean, we had to go shine shoes. We had to go bring coffee to, you know, the older players. You know, you, you could be reading a newspaper. An older guy will come up to you and say, hey, you finished with that paper? As soon as you pick up the paper, you can say, yeah, I finished with the paper. Here you go. You know, after the game, um, you couldn't eat until they eat. You know what I mean? You know, you have to shower last. You know what I mean? Um, you, but you have to be on the bus first, you know? You couldn't drink from this coffee. You have to drink from that coffee. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, man, it's, you know, and um, certain guys was extremely tough, you know? Um, you know, like in Pittsburgh, um, if you go on, if you have a, um, the color was gold and black. A lot of guys will have the black shoes with the gold, with the gold stripes. And you have on a pair of gold stripes, and they'll come and tell and say, hey, you don't own that gold stripe. You go put on a black and white shoes. You know, when you appear and you prove yourself, you could put on a gold, a gold, you know, with the gold swoosh, the gold Nike swoosh. You know, so that's the way they treated you. They treat you like a rookie. You go out there, you got to take infield every day. You got to beat the all you walk every day, but that's what they did. You know? But it's just only one manager. The other players was also coaches too. You know, I played with um, a guy named Lloyd McClendon. He was a veteran player, you know, and Dave Clark, you know, and they used to kind of put me to the side and say, hey, if they yell at you, don't get upset. It's because they like you. You know what I mean? But it was hard for me to communicate with them because our language wasn't the same, you know? Our language, the way the way I spoke is like, what you say? I can't understand that. So they took it as like, I wasn't speaking to them or I didn't know how to speak to them, you know? Yeah. But, but we from the Virgin Islands, we could understand everybody's language, but they can't understand ours, yeah, right. you know? So right. they could have been talking about me and I could have understood, I could have understood everything they say, you know? But when I said something, they couldn't quite understand it. So it was more of a, hey, disrespectful and, you know, he, uh-huh. he doesn't speak our language. So, you know, he's, he's on the other side, you know? And I saw where they kind of, you know, pushed me to the side. My locker was like far away from everybody, but it never really bothered me, you know? But it was more of a, it was just more of um, of just, you know, learning to deal with, with everybody, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but, Interesting. Hey, yeah, it, it was a lot of stuff, you know? I mean, racism was um, was very strong, but it, it, they hit it pretty good, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, they had something that uh, I heard one of the coaches used to say, you know, something like a call control hit. You, control you what? Hit, control hit. Gotcha. You know, meaning that you know you could hit the guy next to you, but you can't show it. You have to control it. You know what I mean? So once you learn these these tones, you learn to you know put one and one together. You know, and then you figure you figure stuff. Who is your friends and who you could trust and who you can't trust. So. Well, let me ask you. Since you're talking about, you play with nine, possible well, maybe around nine possible different teams. What would you say, What which, which team would you say was, I don't want to say favorite, but the team that, which club you enjoy playing the most for? Oh, Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Twins. Minnesota Twins and Boston Red Sox. Okay. So those, those are the two of my favorite players or teams to be playing with. Enjoy playing you with them. Did, you did the, uh, the aura, the atmosphere for you was it fit my style of playing. Okay. You know, especially Minnesota. That's, I mean, and when you, I, that, you, you started at Minnesota, then you got traded, and then at some point, again, you went back. I went back, right? yeah. Yeah. So, um, they, they, the second time they traded me from um, Minnesota, I, I thought that the manager and the GM, they kind of got in a confrontation. You know, mm-hmm. the manager said that, hey, you don't trade a player like him. You know what I mean? You don't trade a player like him to another team. So this guy, he's doing everything he's supposed to do, and he's getting better at the role that he's doing. You know? Now you're going to take him out of comfort zone, and you're going to put him where he's not comfortable anymore. 
you know, and then you're putting him behind the eight ball against their players who they drafted, you know. And mm -hmm. baseball, you know, it has more of a, a, a I don't know, like a, a loyalty, like a loyalty, a, a loyalty. You know, if you if you trade, if you homegrown this guy, mm -hmm. this guy have to play in the big leagues for you, even though you bring a guy in that is better because he don't look good for them. Right. You know, so I get caught up in, you know, on the back burner and not pushing me through the play because they had their own players that they homegrown that they wanted to play or needed to show, hey, we draft this guy because we think that he could play here. But this other guy is better than him, but we still can't put him there. It just got That's interesting. Awesome. So you're correct and I've gone many different directions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're sorting business moves were made different. Yeah. You that's know? how the game is, man. I guess yeah. that's how the game is. Yeah, it's 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 not it's you know like you learn this term or you heard it every day is uh is not who you know. You mm -hmm. know? It's who knows you. Interesting. Right. You know? Who knows you? I like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question. So so then would you do anything different in regards to your career if if you were given a second chance, like anything you, I, I, I mean, it's hard to say, but looking back, um, like what you know now, I, I wish that um, I had taken the time to really learn the game. You know what I mean? I wish I had really taken the time to really learn the game. So, so by you saying that. I, I guess you would say, you know, even though you became a professional baseball player over the years, it took you some time to get to that point. Yeah. Of learning yeah. the game. Yeah. That's you know, interesting. Um, I, and, and what I mean that is, you know, like, you know, you're going out for every job, they say, you know, hey, uh, we're looking for people who experience, you know, look for experience to get a job. But in right. reality, you need the job to gain the experience. Yeah. Right. You know, so you could be walking at McDonald's for 20 years and then you go walk Burger King. You have the experience, but it's not Burger King way. Right. You know, so right. I always say, hey, you need, you know, the, ex the experience to, to actually learn what you're supposed to do. You know, so right. by, by the time that I am playing, I learn that. You know, and I wish that I had taken the time to actually pay attention to the game and learn the yeah. Right, so you feel, I guess, earlier in your, in your career was just more so pure natural talent. Yes. You're yes. basing the game off of. And I've, I've heard that echoed before from other uh, professional baseball players. I've spent a lot of time with, with Kenny Jackson, that's my buddy. Mm -hmm. And he echoed the same exact things that you're saying here. Like he learned to hit, learned to do different things as time went by, where if he had learned certain things, all he had taken. In information better, it could have been a whole different ball game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember playing against Kenny home, and I used to hit, I used to hear everybody talking about how they hated Kenny. Everybody what? hate they hated him. Uh huh. You know they hated playing against him. You know. Okay. And um, and I watched him play one day and. Played on the same team, Vikings, and uh, the way how that guy go out and, and play the game, man. He's not a, a, a big part of my success just by watching him play, man, because he'll go out and he'll give it uh, everything he had. He played the game like it was the last game he ever went to play. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, man. He, he goes and he will take out a double play. He could be up by 20 rounds, and if he could break up a double play, he's going to break up a double play. That's the way he played. He played hard. He he was like the Dennis Rodman of of baseball. You know, mm -hmm. he played the game hard. You know, and I saw him yell at guys if they if they don't hustle about a ball up. You know, and you know everybody was like it's just a game. And it's no, it's not just a game. There's people up there that pay three dollars to watch you play. You got to be entertainers. You have to entertain them. You have to want to bring them back to watch you play, you know. Right. And there's always a kid out there that never seen a game of baseball watching you play. And if you dog it, guess what? They don't want to play. Right. 
you know right. what I mean? And I've heard little kids outside, you know, in, in Frederick State saying, Who oh, ice can Jackson? You know, and just playing hard, you know, and I was like, Yeah, oh, that's a great compliment. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. You know? that, that's what, I mean, we, again, like that's being a role model without even realizing it. Yeah. You know? a positive influence on the younger generation too. But, you I, know, I, as a, as a as a leader, he he was a a, a guy that would say, "Hey, um, I'm gonna show you how to do this." Kenny would be the guy that said, "Watch me do this." You know, watch me go, and what, when you see me go, that's when you go. You know, and I appreciate him for that. You know, the biggest word he used to use is a word called energy. Come on, guys, you gotta have energy. You know, maybe we gonna lose, but let me out hustle them. But I'll tell you, man, I'm coaching. I, I have the opportunity now to be around the guy um, as an assistant coach. And just being around him with baseball, and he bringing the same energy, bro. Yeah. All the time. When it comes to baseball, you're getting 110% yep. all the time. Yeah, man. I mean, and, uh, that's great. And he's another guy, too, as well, who falls short in certain ways for whatever reason. But tremendous baseball player as well, man. Oh yeah, oh, and, and not, not only not, not only a, a good baseball player, man. He's a great friend too. The yes. good people person. Absolutely. You know, you get him on the field, he's he's an animal. He's the Hulk on the field. You get him off the field, he's like David Banner. Yeah, yeah, yeah a guy you can sit down and talk to. You yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, he yeah. he is he is a good friend. Yeah. All right. I got I got about three more questions. Okay. All right, so you were always known to have a great bat, and I will, I'm gonna say this from way back when, when from the time you were small, you might you might say, ah, no, no, da da da, but growing up playing, even before I even met you, I was hearing about this major coming to. I was hearing about other guys, but hearing about you as well. Mm -hmm. So you always been known to have a great bat. So what would you say are qualities that a good hitter should possess or develop through their bat, bat John? Well, um, so I'm talking more for like more mature guys, like guys who know, you know, guys playing high school baseball going into college. Like, what, what well, are you? What, what are you? Well, the, the foremost thing you you have to learn to make adjustments. You have to make adjustments. You know, you you, you have to understand the game and watch the pitcher throw, and then you just have to hit situational. A lot of people don't understand hitting situational. You know, it's just what the pitcher is going to give you something, you have to be able to take it. You know, if you listen to baseball, you know, baseball will talk to you, you know. It will tell you what it's going to do, you know. You just got to listen to it. Right. You know, you're watching a game and you know in a situation this guy is supposed to bunt. If you don't bunt, ah, it will cost him the game. It will right. tell you what you're supposed to do. But it's just like hitting. It, hitting will let you know what it's supposed to do, what you're supposed to do. Right. You know? So, you, so I mean, a, a lot of amateurs focus more on how many hits they get per game uh, versus quality at bats. So, you know, what, what, what's your take on that? Well, uh, again, you can, you can have four hits in one game, but it doesn't make you a good hitter. You know, you just got four hits. You know, but you could go over four and walk the count and see a lot more pitches because it's not about hitting, it's about quality at bats. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we was always told to wear a pitcher out. You know, everybody try to take a five, six pitch at bat. Let me see what you could do taking five pitch or six pitch at bat. Let's, you know, walk the pitcher. Let him walk. I don't keep a strike out. Don't be afraid to strike out. Let me see if you could have a six or you know five to six or seven pitch at bat. So it's, it's, pitch it, so it's interesting you're saying that. So the, what what's making me think about is as a hitter now, you have to be a guy that able to see the ball well, see the ball deep or whatever however you want to call it. Um, not a guy who's trying to jump and hit the first pitch. A guy who, but in order for you to walk the count, you gotta be able to walk and stay and pitch it and see pitches well. Yes. Foul yeah. pitches are, fight the pitcher. So, be a, be a better two strike hitter. 
you got to be able to hit with two strikes and walk a come. Yeah, well, not only hitting with two strikes, you just you just got to get rid of that fear of striking out. Okay. You know, if, if a player, uh, I'll give you an example, a, a player like Vladimir Guerrero, he didn't care if he strike out. You know, but I tell you what, pitcher was more fair to pitch to him because they know if they throw the ball close to the plate, he could do damage. Right. You know, but the right. thing what every, everybody's telling these kids now, they say, well, you know, two strikes, you got to choke up, you got to do this. Well, my biggest thing was, if you're hitting, you're on offense. You cannot be defensive if you're on offense. Be offensive. You got to be offensive. And if you strike out, everybody strikes out. But if you strike out and you know why you strike out, it makes you that much of a better hitter the next time you come up. Good point. That's a very good point. All right, my brother. Uh, so since leaving Pro Ball, what you say, what amateur programs have you been involved with? And I, I used to coach a travel ball team for about seven, eight years. And... Um, them boys was good, man, because they they were heads up baseball players. You know, um, I, I I would give them things to do in the game. You know, I was like, look, we focusing on winning. Right? We could win. Let's focus on doing something different. You know, like we play a team today, and I said, let's beat this team with our legs. You know, let me get on base. Let me steal second and tall. We can beat this team with our legs. Next time we play them. We're going to beat them with our arm. We're going to outpitch them. You know? Uh, next time, we we'll beat them with our bats. So we're giving them something each and every time something different to do. Gotcha. You know? So I had this one game where I used to tell my kids, I say, hey, um, if you get a base hit, try to get a double out of it. And if you make it to second base, you get $5. You know, so you'll get base it and you'll try to make it to second base and you'll be out, you know, and the other team will be like, that's stupid. Why would you do that? But then you get in the fifth and then one of my kids hit a base hit and he going hard. So they went feel that kind of look up, but you make it to second base. Yeah. So all my kids saw, oh, that's what coach talking about. And once they saw that, they was like, you know what? It became more dangerous on the, on the base. I you know, right. you know, and then you know, certain games I will like. Um, I will have the guys. If a leadoff guy gets on, the next mm -hmm. guy can bunt into second. The next guy can bunt into third. The next guy try to get in it. You know, so even yeah. though, so even though if my um second hitter lead off with a with a base hit, my third hitter will come and bunt him over to um second. My cleanup hitter will try to bunt him over to third. And everybody is still that's the stupid, dumbest thing in the world. But you know what? When these kids get all that, they're not going to be taught hitters or four hitters anymore. Yeah. They learn to bunt and you know the purpose of bunting. What what age group was this? This was um 13, 14 year olds. Okay. Yeah. And I also did it with um 16, 17 year olds. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I taught them the purpose of bunting because you learn how to defend it if you are on defense. Right. And the you only know? way you're going to learn to do the only thing you, the only way you're going to learn to do things is if you do it. If you do it. You, you can know? practice it, but if you're doing it during a game, it ain't worth much. And then I had another thing I used to do was I never used to coach the bases. Yeah, never you told me about that one. I never <laughs> coached the bases. And everybody yeah. was like, well, how's the kids them going to know? Well, how are the kids not going to know if they if they depend on somebody? The game is right in front of you. You know what you could do, and you know when you know what you can do. You coached third base before. How much mistakes you made at third base? Uh, quite, but, quite. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. But I'm just trying to give these kids a heads up of knowing what to do, when to tag, when to take the extra bases. Right. You know, just the little things to make your job that much easier. Coaching them at all this. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I think I think some 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 parents would have been like, yeah, we gotta get rid of that guy. But I could definitely yeah. see, I definitely could see the, uh, yeah. the benefit of what you were doing. Definitely. 
All right, I got one more question for you, my boy. Close uh -huh. this up. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so this one here kind of going to piggyback back to the VI. Okay. So if you had the influence and resources to impact Virgin Islands being space, but when you played and today, the reason why I say when you played, because we kind of, you, you kind of already talked about it, about the things if they were done back then, how it could have impact maybe the future, even now, I think could have been different. So as to date, I would say as to date, what will you do different to enhance the quality and development of the game? Well, I, I don't know how much you are aware of what's going on down there with just, I mean, outside of COVID or before COVID, like the, 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 um, where the game was, like the, the, the level of play, the, 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 the fields, conditions, blah, 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 all of that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. or how, how, how you feel you would, you would be of influence? Well, I, I like back when I played, um, parents was involved in the game. Your parents mm -hmm. was there, you know. Your parents was there, you know. So even though at practice, your parents also came and watched you practice, you know. Also with other seven, eight other parents are there watching you practice. So right. it was like playing in a fishbowl, and you could see everything when you go, you right. know. Rather than know that I heard that, you know, people just drop the kids off and go yeah. and come back. And sometimes it's just one or two coach with, you know, 10, 12 kids, you know. And it's just, you know, a free for all. And then you can't get to these kids because they're, the mind span and there's, you know, nobody to focus. And, you know, the kids doing the right thing because, you know, you probably have an hour practice now. You know, yeah. it's, you know, so it's not much you could cover. Right. But it, 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 my, the parents are the big factor because after practice, the parents will say, hey, go out and do this here. Go out there and play ball. You know what I mean? Go out there and, and, and you know, start a, a ball game. You know, just don't go to practice just to practice. You need to play other than practice. You know, you need to do stuff. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's, that's your, that was, you would say that's the biggest pet peeve when it comes to yeah I, the parents have to be involved the parents have to be involved man you know you don't have to be a great player but you know that you're on a shot leash knowing that if i go far i hate my parents and my mother and father there you yeah. know what i mean so that keeps for, you in line for, for me over the years one of the things so i i would say is um and because baseball has been sort of like an evolutionary been evolving somewhat been evolving there's a lot of new uh through technology and different things a lot of new innovative ways to train and do things so certain things so one, one of my biggest things and we have, we have never really done it down there is coaches have never been forced or are put in a position where they should learn new things be certified uh be trained you understand what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. one of my things with, with, with coaches in the BI, because I could tell you, I coached down there for like over five years. And since I moved and transitioned to the state, I've learned a hell of a lot more in addition to what I know. So, we kind of get stuck like a crab in a, in a, in a, in a barrel because you, what you know is what you know, and that's what you're teaching. And yeah. there's yeah. no, nothing in place to say, hey, you got to improve, you got to get better. There's more to learn. There's, you know what I mean? Because when it comes to baseball, any sport, I would say, anything in life, there's always more to learn. You can't yeah. stop learning. If you think you know the game enough, you ain't know the game at all. If you understand what I'm saying. And, and to me, that's one of the areas that moving forward and out, that I feel that they need to really put focus into it. If you want to be a coach, and I mean, people are volunteering, so it's kind of hard to force people to do stuff like that. But if you want to really increase and improve the, 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 the level of play, uh, develop the players, because at the end of the day, the coaches want to deal with the, with the kids. So if, you, if you're only stuck in your old ways and you're not picking up new information and learning, like even, even in terms of learning about psychology with children, every child ain't the same. Yeah. You can't talk to everybody the same. You can't teach every child the exact same method. Just learning all of that. Um, I, I think that's a big area definitely down there. They could improve. 
in, in, in okay. enhancing okay. the coaching environment. So, 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 what about the goal? I, I mean, every every league supposed to have a goal, right? A goal. A goal. Got to have a goal. A goal. I absolutely yeah. agree. Yeah. You know, because you know, like what you said, you have seven, eight, or let's say you have ten coaches coaching ten different kids. That's ten different ways of coaching kids. But the problem is when these kids get to our stars now, everything that they learn from the other coaches, they have to get erased and learn from now one coach's style. As if well, every well, go ahead. Well, let me say this. So, so for me with baseball, baseball is a thing everybody might have this style, but there are certain fundamental things. If you're teaching a kid how to bond, I ain't saying there's one way to bond, but there's a fundamental approach to bond. If you're teaching a guy to play the infield and field ball, there is not a million and one way to necessarily teach how to field. There's a, there, there is fundamental approaches that all, even if you might have a little different style, Still, we're supposed to kind of be the same, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, but but again, we need that common goal. So when all these kids get together to play in the All Star team, it's yeah. easier to coach them instead of have to teach them how to do certain things. Right. That holds back the learning process and the playing process going to All Star. Because you know you've been on teams where, man, if we had just did this a little better, we could have won. Absolutely. You, you know what I mean? So. So that would bring my point to say it's just, and I'm telling you, the other islands, the, the Curacao, Puerto Rico to a point, they just have somewhat of a system. Yes. yes. And when I say that, everybody have the style. You have your own style within a system, but a system have a certain way to go about teaching certain things. Everybody gonna learn how to bond. Because I mean, like even, you know, with, with, with Little League Baseball, every, 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 yeah, you know, every team don't teach the players how to do certain things like bunting and whatnot. And then when it comes to Alsa, wherever you got to teach them. So part of a system would require for every team to be able to learn a set of tasks to perform and so on and so forth. Skills. You understand what I'm saying? Let's, let's use the word skills. Okay, skills. You know. Right. You know, right. Even pitching, pitching, catching, running the bases. All these things is skill. Baseball is a skill game. Right. It's a skill game. And like what you said, if you put all these coaches and have them start to fight, because the big goal, like any other country, is to win. It's to win yeah. on the big stage. That's what attracts everybody. You know? Yeah. I you know, I have said this plenty of time. If they attack, you know, the six or seven best players from St. Croix, and take the six or seven best players from St. Thomas and march them, okay? Now, what's, what's that going to force? It will force people from the Virgin Islands to watch the team, not just a team from St. Croix, because if a team from St. Croix playing, nobody from St. Thomas don't know who these kids are. So right. nobody in St. Thomas is going to be interested in watching. If St. Right. Thomas win, people from St. Croix is not going to watch because you don't know who, you know, who plan? We don't know nobody. Right. But if we march and you know you have your seven and seven, now you're gonna force everybody to watch. You go the right. kids are going to watch because they, the first thing they're gonna say is, I want to play an Virgin Islands team. Absolutely. So yeah. we, 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 we basically hit our mark. Okay. <laughs> so this thing here, uh, this was a great interview. I I I, I appreciate you. For giving me this opportunity to have this conversation with you and talk some ball and get to know you a little bit better, who you are and, and whatnot. But um great interview. Uh, I think people are gonna really enjoy this. Uh, as I like I told you, this is gonna be on uh, Sports Park and Rec Facebook page tomorrow. So if you, if you wanna go and check it out, it's gonna be from eleven thirty to twelve thirty. That's when I'm going to post it way to be seen so once again my brother appreciate the time appreciate the information and uh we'll be talking some more that's a problem hang, man. hang on i'm gonna i'm gonna take it off the record but we still got chat the whole okay on. all right